This video is the first in a series on the practice of controlled drainage. The learning objectives for this video are to first, understand and be able to describe what controlled drainage is. Second, understand and be able to describe the goals of controlled drainage. And then finally, understand and be able to list site characteristics for fields that are most suitable for controlled drainage. So starting with what is controlled drainage? A simple definition is, Controlled drainage is the use of water control structures in the drainage system to control when and how much water is released from the drainage system. A more complete working definition from the drainage group of the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers, or ASABE, is shown here. A couple points to note here. One is that the practice is also sometimes referred to as drainage water management, which is the name used in the USDA NRCS Conservation Practice Standard. Another is that we are regulating the height to which the water table can rise and not the height of the water table itself, which we'll discuss more later. The illustrations shown here are typical of water control structures for control drainage that use adjustable stop logs to raise and lower the outlet elevation. The picture and graphic on the left are typical control structures for subsurface drainage systems, and we'll focus on subsurface drainage systems, but Control drainage can also be used for surface drainage, and the picture on the right is an example of control structure in a surface drainage ditch. And in systems that use lift stations, the pump operation can be used to manage the system for controlled drainage. Some basic concepts of controlled drainage then are, during the non-growing season when drainage is not needed, the outlet elevation is raised to hold back water to reduce nutrient loss. And in the growing season, during periods when full drainage isn't needed, the outlet elevation can be raised to reduce nutrient loss and also to conserve water in the soil to help supply crop water demands. Then, when full drainage is needed, so typically leading up to planting and other spring field operations, potentially prior to fall harvest, or after large rain events, the control structure is then fully open to put the system back into conventional drainage mode. As mentioned earlier, an important concept to understand about control drainage is that it only controls the drainage by adjusting the outlet elevation. While that impacts the water table elevation and the height to which it can rise, the actual water table elevation will depend on the interaction with other components of the field water balance. So, starting with precipitation, which is our primary input to the water balance, of that precipitation, some infiltrates into the soil, and then some may leave the system as surface runoff. Of the water that infiltrates, much of that will return to the atmosphere as evapotranspiration. And then in poorly drained soils, we can use artificial drainage to remove excess water from the field. Then we can have lateral or vertical groundwater flow into or out of our control volume. Finally, we have the change in soil water storage between time steps to complete the water balance. Controlled drainage then only controls the drainage component of the water balance. As we control the drainage, other components will adjust to maintain that water balance, and those interrelationships will then determine the actual height of the water table. If we wanted to actually maintain a certain water table depth, we need the ability to add additional water to the system through irrigation. So looking at it another way, in conventional or free drainage, water will drain from the system whenever the water table rises above the drains. With controlled drainage, we can manage the drainage and hold some of the water in the soil until the water table drops, for example in the summer during periods when evapotranspiration exceeds precipitation. With an additional water source, we can use sub-irrigation by adding water back to the system to manage the water table. So now that we have an understanding of what controlled drainage is, let's talk about why we would want to manage drainage using controlled drainage. The primary reasons for doing controlled drainage are summed up in the Golden Rule of Drainage, which was coined by Dr. Wayne Skaggs, Emeritus Professor at North Carolina State University, which says, only drain the amount of water necessary to ensure trafficable conditions for field operations and to provide an aerated crop root zone. Any drainage in excess of this likely carries away nitrate and water that is no longer available for crop uptake. So, controlled drainage can be used to reduce nitrate losses from drainage systems. 
This is primarily from reducing the amount of drain flow, which then reduces the load of nitrate leaving the system. A synthesis study of controlled drainage sites from across the Midwest and North Carolina as part of the Transforming Drainage Project found that controlled drainage reduced drain flow by 39% on average and nitrogen loss by 40%. Controlled drainage may also help encourage some denitrification, but this and other studies have found no significant differences in nitrate concentrations from controlled drainage. Controlled drainage may also help reduce dissolved reactive phosphorus losses through drainage, but more research is really needed on this. Then, unlike many other conservation drainage practices, by providing additional water management capabilities, controlled drainage can potentially also have positive crop yield impacts. So if we look at some of the water management challenges and opportunities on poorly drained soils, this figure shows typical annual patterns of precipitation in blue and evapotranspiration or ET in green. Note that these curves will vary depending on location and these particular curves were developed using data from Eastern South Dakota but the same general patterns will apply for row crops across the Midwest. What we see here then is that during the spring and fall, precipitation exceeds ET, creating the need for drainage in poorly drained soils. However, in the middle of the row crop growing season, ET will generally outpace precipitation. So stored soil moisture helps buffer this difference, but in many years there can be periods of water deficits that limit crop yield. Controlled drainage then can help store some additional early season moisture to be available for crops later in the growing season. Another synthesis study of controlled drainage impacts on corn yield from the Transforming Drainage Project shows that in drier years, controlled drainage can boost yields. The figure shown here, <clears throat> where the x-axis is the difference in dry and wet stress indices, so then values greater than zero are drier conditions and values less than zero are wetter conditions. The y-axis, then, is the change in corn yield as a percent. So in drier years, the results showed corn yield increases of 5 to 10 percent from controlled drainage as compared to conventional drainage. The results also showed that in wetter years, there can be a yield decrease from added wet stress. It should be noted, however, that these were research sites where the control structure settings were generally managed based on calendar dates instead of being actively managed based on water table or soil moisture conditions. So more active management to provide additional drainage when needed during wetter periods or after large rain events could and should help limit or eliminate some of these yield losses. But the results do show that active management is required both to maximize the yield benefits and also minimize any yield losses. Now that we've covered the primary reasons for doing controlled drainage, let's take a look at what makes a site suitable for controlled drainage. Here's a list of general suitability criteria developed by Dr. Richard Cook at the University of Illinois. In some cases, it may make sense to use controlled drainage on targeted non-pattern tiled drainage systems but pattern drainage systems are generally make the controlled drainage impacts more consistent over a larger and more defined drainage area. Related to that first point, designing and managed controlled drainage will work best in systems with a defined drainage area, where we have maps of the drainage system, and controlled drainage may exacerbate problems in failing drainage systems, so it's generally better suited to newer systems that are in good repair. As discussed earlier, Controlled drainage will be most effective when the system is actively managed, so it needs to be convenient enough to do that. So questions like, how many control structures will be required? Are they manually operated or are they automated? Can control structures be located at the field edges outside of trafficked areas? Or will control structures have to be in the crop field or other heavily trafficked areas and have to be farmed around? are all going to help determine how convenient it will be to manage the system. When we raise the outlet for a controlled drainage system, which will elevate the water table at times, will that impact neighboring fields? For instance, are there nearby load spots in surrounding fields that would be negatively impacted by controlled drainage? A fundamental question for controlled drainage, then, is whether the soils are conducive to maintaining a high water table. 
For example, if the soils are sandier topsoils over a restrictive clay layer, it may be difficult to maintain an elevated water table because of lateral movement of water away from the field. Another situation could be where there is a discontinuous restrictive layer where water can find areas to move vertically downward. In either case, the controlled drainage will not have the desired impact. Finally, one of the biggest constraints is the slope of the land and the field targeted for controlled drainage. So focusing on the land slope criterion and using the phrase flat as a pancake for illustration, controlled drainage will work best on fields with flat topography. So a field that is flat, like this nice stack of pancakes here, is ideal for controlled drainage. In that case, the layout of the drainage system doesn't matter because we can use one control structure at the outlet to manage the entire system. However, if we tip that stack of pancakes over so that now we have some slope to the field, the drainage system layout becomes much more important. So in this layout, that would be typical of many tip traditional drainage systems, where the mains running along the bottom of the field and the laterals are running up the slope, we can put a control structure at the outlet, but as we move up the slope, the difference between the elevation in the field and the outlet elevation in the control structure becomes big enough that we no longer control the drainage in those upper parts of the field. So if we wanted to add more control to this field, there's no good place to put another control structure. We'd have to put a control structure on each individual lateral. If we want to design a system better for control drainage in this field, we'd have to use a different design. So here, the main run up the slope and the laterals run across the slope. With this design then we can add additional control structures on the main and divide the field into separate control zones for control drainage over a larger area. If we look at what that looks like in a profile view, each control structure divides the field into those control zones and then resets the outlet elevation to control the drainage in that zone. Until more recently, that would entail using multiple of those traditional manually operated control structures. So having too many control structures on sloping fields becomes a real management challenge. However, a recent innovation is the use of float-activated pressure valves designed to hold a specified level of head behind them before opening a valve for drainage when the water level rises above that. So with one traditional control structure, these float activated valves then automatically respond based on the water level behind that first control structure, which makes management much easier for fields requiring multiple control structures. A standard rule of thumb then for field slopes for controlled drainage is that slopes of less than 0.5% are ideal, and then slopes up to 1% are considered suitable. The float activated valves or some of the developing automated structures may help push the envelope beyond that 1% in some cases, but still feasibility in terms of cost of additional control structures becomes more difficult as we move beyond those 1% slopes. A GIS tool based on geospatial data of land slopes and soils developed by the Transforming Drainage Project is one way to help identify fields potentially suitable for controlled drainage. One other consideration for suitability for controlled drainage is field shape. If we elevate the water table in a field with controlled drainage and the surrounding fields are not using controlled drainage, that creates a gradient for lateral movement of water from the field, which will be influenced by field shape. One way we can look at this is to use an edge factor that relates the perimeter length of the field to the field area. A square field, shown here, will have an edge factor of 1. For a rectangular field of the same area, where two sides are twice as long and the other two sides are half as long, the edge factor for that field is 1.25. Since the rectangular field has greater perimeter relative to its field area, the potential for lateral losses of water there are going to be greater. So fields with an edge factor closer to 1 will better minimize those losses. So, in this video you've learned what controlled drainage is, the goals of controlled drainage, and suitability criteria for controlled drainage. 
In the next video, we'll discuss the design of controlled drainage systems.